Just Thank want you. to check if um, Raj, are you with us and are you ready? If you're I hope able. so. <laughs> I, hope you can see me I can see you and hear you clearly. So Excellent. it's it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Raj Rajarayan, OBE. Raj Rajarayan is Professor and Head of Restorative Dentistry at the College of Medicine and Dentistry. He was past Dean at the Royal College of Surgeons in England and responsible for postgraduate dentistry for London as Associate Dean at the London Medical and Dental Deanery. He has delivered, he has delivered over 1,000 international lectures and has helped change continuing professional development in the UK. He was an advisor to the Secretary of State for Health, one of the three wise men to the Lord Chancellor on appointments of magistrates and judges and a member of the General Dental Council. He was made an officer of the Order of the British Empire by Her Majesty the Queen for his services to dentistry. I'm pleased to announce he's presenting on aesthetics and ethics. Is it a paradigm shift? Thank you, Raj. Thank you very much, Andrew. Looks like I've got a lot more time to uh, spend with you if you so wish to have that time spent with me. By all means, Raj. <laughs> uh, as head of restorative dentistry, I, I can't tell you how delighted I am to have uh, 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 Professor Shamir Mehta, Professor Ziad Ani, and Professor Wyman Chan in my department. They are a great strength to our College of Medicine and Dentistry. And from the lectures that you have heard from them, you can see that there is a steep learning curve you can meet if you have your minds open. My lecture, because I'm head of department, can be more challenging. And therefore they gave me this topic, aesthetics and ethics. Is there a paradigm shift effectively? And I thought I'd share with you what is happening in the Western world and how it might affect you as well. Because all lands come to the same pathway sooner or later. Of course, these are some advertisements from dental practices. And I, I envy them because I was in Harley Street in a referral only practice, and I did not even have a business card. All my patients came in purely because my colleagues referred them, not because patients referred them, because colleagues referred them. And the one advantage of having a practice, which is a tertiary care practice, doing full mouth reconstructions and colleagues referring patients to you, is they don't usually complain about your bill. So, anyway, other practices are not quite so fortunate and they do have to advertise. And here's a very nice advertisement I have seen. And there's another one, even nicer, dedicated to creating beautiful smiles. And then of course, your smile is our vision. But the question I need to ask is, yes, who is it? Who is it that does not do good teeth? Which practice does ugly teeth? Why is all this marketing so important, especially when you have so many other colleagues doing exactly the same thing you are? Or are they, is the question one needs to ask. So this is about practices, which are marketing. The next question I need to ask also is the dentist themselves. In the UK, we are very strictly regulated, less strictly now than we used to be regulated. So in those days, we could never advertise. Now we can advertise, but, it is unusual, probably unexpected, for a dentist in the UK to call themselves the best cosmetic dentist. Even more unusual to be able to advertise as the best cosmetic dentist in a certain town. I mean, having looking at this, uh, I, I'm sure she probably is the best cosmetic dentist in Houston. But when you look at the qualifications, it's about the basic dental qualification anybody could ever have to do dentistry in any country. So with a box standard qualification, to call yourself a best cosmetic dentist, well, it takes a lot of courage. And I admire the courage of some people. And I wish I could be as courageous as some of the people who market. So I actually looked at more American websites. Yes, because I wanted to answer the question, what makes you the best? Whereas some people did not have any credentialing as to what makes them the best. Some people do. So for example, there's a Lux list of modern luxury. Uh, the winner here was a chap called Peter Bolden. And, and that means somebody else has credentialed him. But of course, what does a Lux list mean? Lux list has the best sommelier, that's wine people, the best chef, the best hot couture make, manufact maker, you know, the best dressmaker, all that kind of stuff. So, and the credentialing of this gentleman is that he's, a, he's the distinction of being a fellow of the Academy of Comprehensive Aesthetics. 
now part of the Smile Source Network. And I thought, what on earth is that? In any case, I looked into this person uh, because it was very admirable. I mean, I, I was envious of the position that this person had. And I found he also did a course on bulletproof mentality. What is a bulletproof mentality? Usually you have a bulletproof car when somebody's trying to shoot you. So why do you need a bulletproof mentality? And looking even further, I found another course, which was dealing with upset patients. Oops. Then when I looked at the credentials, I saw there was more than just the basic dental qualifications. There was a fellow of something, fellow of another thing, fellow of other things, and fellow of more things. And then I went in and looked to see what these fellowships were. And these fellowships are really based on a lot of societies where people get together and create a club and give each other fellowships. One or two of them actually, you have to answer a question paper and pass, but by and last, most of them are credentialed by being a thoroughly good person or knowing someone who has a good contact. Nevertheless, aesthetic dentistry is very important. Where would Tom Cruise be without getting his teeth fixed? I mean, so many actors, so many personalities, so many politicians, so many royalty, and I should know, I treat a lot of them, want to have nicer teeth because they are projecting their personality and their aesthetic appeal. So where does it all leave us? I looked at the last list again because I was curious about this last list. And in fact, in 2019, the same year the other gentleman was on the last list was another dentist called Dr. Alan Malouf. And one thing I loved about him was that he assisted patients uh, with odd hours of dental emergencies and also came through on the social front, giving patients tickets to 80 San Francisco Giants baseball games per year. Wow. If that doesn't get you good patients, I'm not sure what will. But sadly, the poor gentleman passed away that same year. Uh, but his sister said, and he was a dapper dentist, so in other words, he dressed extremely well. But his sister said where he would be with Patty Hearst, Jane Fonda, Ariana Huffington, Prince Charles. I mean, he was a man with the stars. So does that make a good dentist was the question. So the key question for the first part of this lecture is, what makes a good dentist? And having been a very long time in dentistry and in extremely successful practice and having given over a thousand international lectures and produced papers and changed a lot of the way dentistry is taught and, and examined in the UK, I came to the conclusion that being a good dentist, you need good contacts because good contacts make a big difference. Yes, because people come already trusting you. Good marketing is very useful because good marketing adds to the feel good factor of your staff, not just your staff, but also your patients because they think that you are somebody important. A good personality is extremely helpful, especially when you come to cosmetic dentistry because cosmetic dentistry is absolutely filled with patients with different perceptions to you. And if you can get on with them, you can convince them, you can discuss with them, you can empathize with them and they can empathize with you, your work will be much better than if you just produce good work alone. The emotional, intellectual quotient, the connection becomes so important. So a good personality, a gentle, kind personality, all makes a difference. Good clinical dentistry is very useful. I've seen lots of extremely successful patients, uh, uh, dentists, whose patients I've had to re-reconstruct. So being very successful and very profitable and very wealthy does not necessarily mean you do good clinical dentistry. In fact, there are some very famous names dentist work I've had to rechange. But having said that, if you did good clinical dentistry, it's more than a bonus because then others, your colleagues will realize how good you really are. And finally, good peer reviewed credentials. Good peer reviewed credentials. I think if you're on your pathway to proving yourself in this world and you're starting out, is extremely helpful, having additional proper qualifications, not by the post fellowships, 
but real structured peer reviewed education, it all becomes important. But you could make a very good living, a very good life and be a fun, fantastic dentist with any of the above, but I would think that you would prefer to do it with all of the above. And that's really why we have this College of Medicine and Dentistry and Professor uh, Al Mazri is very keen on young people with open innovation, challenging minds. We love to be challenged. We do not teach you like an undergraduate establishment or an undergraduate school, which is now postgraduate uh, produced. We are mostly clinicians. We've been there. We've learned from our mistakes. It's from our hindsight that we have generated our insight. And we will teach you. I mean, the field of occlusion is built on lies about lies about lies about lies. There's hardly any evidence in most of dentistry. Much of the evidence is based on your experiential learning. And of that, we have plenty. And we will challenge you. And we will expect you to challenge us as well. Now, let me challenge you on this. What is this? Is this cosmetic dentistry? Do you think this is cosmetic dentistry? What about this patient? This patient turning out to be this. Is this cosmetic dentistry is my key question. Is this what you look at and think, wow, I wish I could do this. Who matters in this work? Who is the person who did this cosmetic dentistry? That is the key question. Whose work are you showing? Because the illusion needs an illusionist to change them out from what it was to what it is. You need someone who is exceptional, who does that work. Is it the dental technician in the work I've shown you? The answer I'm afraid is not. It's got nothing to do with the dental technician. It's to do with IT consultant. That was to do with my son, who is an illustrator and animator. And he works a lot with Photoshop. But I can, I can definitely confirm to you that my work is in Photoshop. My work is real, honest work. They are on analog slides. Beware of international speakers, Mr. Howdy Doody, who come and sell you their beautiful dentistry. I can almost guarantee, because I have given lectures right across the world. You name a country, I've been there. And after our lectures, we sit at the bar and we have a drink and we have a natter and we have a laugh. And by and large, I can tell you, you are seeing touched up photographs. Yes, Adobe Photoshop is fantastic. When you finish that course, go and buy this. Maybe you might have to adjust one or two of your work. You see, Photoshop teeth. How, you know, you have to take a double look to see that they have been Photoshopped. The art of this is phenomenal. Beware of lectures on cosmetic dentistry. Yes, the art of deception. What you see is not what you get. So I would say, don't despair about your work. Yours is real dentistry. And if you're honest about your real dentistry, we can make you, we can teach you to make it amazing and exceptional. So what about dentistry and aesthetics? What is beauty? Beauty is truth, truth is beauty. That's Keats, our great poet. Anatole of France said it was more profound than truth itself. Yes. The symmetry of a beautiful face by Stéphane Marcotte, a plastic surgeon. So to get this beauty, most people say, oh, I use the golden ratio. Now, what is this golden ratio? Whatever it is, I can tell you it is the position from which you look at. You can create a golden ratio for anything as long as you're willing to turn your head in any one direction. In fact, the science says it's rubbish. It doesn't affect teeth. It doesn't apply to teeth. So a lot of the stuff that you go back on and you look at and you were taught and people wax lyrical, it's all lies. It's more con after more con. The problem with aesthetics is as a human being, the dentist can see more than three to five million colors, but we don't have the vocabulary to describe it. And some people are better able to translate it than others. Certainly women are known scientifically to be better than men. So my nurse always helps, and luckily for me, in my practice, my technician was. 
We both work together in the same building. And the responsibility is well passed on to your technician. And I need help in the form of a background support. And if you're looking at a shade for more than five seconds, your, your rods and cones have already tied out and you get the wrong feedback. So five seconds is the maximum time you have to make additional shade. Otherwise you've got to go away and come back again. And shade taking is extraordinary. It's all about lighting conditions. Now the lighting conditions in the UK is different to your lighting conditions in Dubai or in Turkey. Our lights are Northern lights. We do not take our, our, our shade taking in daylight. We need a bluer light source for British patients. So it is different. And remember your visual acuity is just five seconds, five seconds and it moves on. And of course, some people are colorblind. You need to check on colorblindness. And of course, you know, a large percentage, 40% of males have some degree of colorblindness. That's why women are better than. And after 15 seconds, definitely all your receptors tire. So, and also shade guides, they are rubbish. Let's look at the Vita shade guide. Why is it that the world has Vita shade guide? The reason the Vita shade guide is worldwide and used by all of us is that when I graduate as an undergraduate, long before many of you were born, is that they gave all dentists a free Vita shade guide. The reason every dentist got a free Vita shade guide because dentists are mean people. We don't want to spend money if we can't, if we can help it. The reason we got a free Vita shade guide was because Vita they knew if we prescribe a Vita shade A2 or A3 or whatever, the technician then had to go and buy the Vita porcelains. Brilliant, wasn't it? Brilliant. Yes, manufacture a car, Give the car free, but let it run on a particular type of petrol, which nobody else has. You made your fortune. And the Vita Shade Guide is rubbish because the way it is arranged, A1, A2, A3, A4, is nothing to do with teeth. Teeth are about value. That's why composites are so brilliant. Composites are metameric. Metameric means they can disappear into the mouth. That's why acrylic dentures look fantastic, even if you get the shade wrong. You have five shades for acrylic dentures. They all look good in anybody's mouth. Porcelains, you have to really work hard because they are not metameric. You have to build them in. All because their values are not as phenomenal as acrylics. So composites, greatest success is because it's made of acrylic, methyl methacrylate. Yes, bis GMA, bisphenol A, glycidyl methacrylate. UDMA, Divoclar product, urethane dimethacrylate, even adhesives, 4-meta, methacryloxy, ethyl, trimelylate, and hydrate. Everything is a methyl methacrylate with a bit of epoxy resin, a whole lot of fillers thrown in to reduce the shrinkage, and voila, you have a material that blends in the mouth. The only reason it looks bad is because you don't know how to use it, and we will teach you how to use it. There are small secrets that make big differences. You don't have to spend more than 10 minutes to make a beautiful, aesthetic posterior composite filling. I mean, the preparation takes time, the adhesion takes time, the first layer takes time, but the aesthetic finish, we don't use burrs at all. Teach you how to do it. Looks like a million dollars. Nobody will even know that these are composite teeth. And they are great because they are metameric. They disappear into the mouth. Most of the time, dentists get it wrong because they don't know how to make it disappear into the mouth because these materials want to disappear into the mouth. So if you have a Vita shade guide, please rearrange your shades. You'll find life so much easier. Start with the B1 first, because this is on value basis. You'll find your shade taking improves so many percent. And now you'll find the modern Vita shade guides and all, all based on values. Hmm? But in any case, what is aesthetic? I mean, the Mayans thought this was aesthetic. In this century, I mean, I've lectured in Kazakhstan and other countries and dentists have shown me some of the, some of the teeth of some of, their, some of their local communities, their local tribes people. And for them, doing getting teeth like this is aesthetic, not our concept of aesthetic. Concept of aesthetics is unique to that individual, to that culture, to their brain, to that nation, amongst lots of other things. So this is, that plastic surgeon's patient. 
Is she beautiful? Is she beautiful? Or is she beautiful? It's the same patient, same with all I've done is elongated it. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So by and large, if you can speak to the coconut of the patient, if the patient is convinced about you, a lot of your aesthetic dentistry becomes so much more easy. But if you have a patient who has personality problems, who really look like the back end of a horse, yes, who are trouble or waiting for trouble, you ain't going to get it right. These people with body dysmorphic disorders, amongst other things, will always be a cause of problem. It's a mental problem. You really don't want to practice with mental patients. You know, there are seven and a half billion people out there, more than enough for each and every one of us. In the UK, we are crying for dentists. We don't have enough dentists to fix cases. Huh? Remember, you don't have to treat everyone because there is always somebody out there who wants to treat everyone. Let them treat you. You don't be a fool. Let's show you some other bits. It'll dovetail into the lectures of my two other colleagues or three other colleagues, yes, of today. So this is a patient who came in to see me and he was getting on a bit in age, but he was being honored by Her Majesty the Queen, just as I have, um, I'm grateful for that. And he was going to give a speech on a very important occasion. And of course, patients like this, very easy. It's a 15 minute makeover. You don't use a burr on these patients, you use a scalpel, you use your composites, any shade, the shades you never use on real composite cases, because you're going to do a trial composite run on this patient. So you just pop on a bit of composite. Yes, you pat it in with the back end of a scalpel. You get the nurse to zap it for five seconds, two seconds, one second, and then you shave it with your scalpel blade and you just keep adding it. You just keep adding it and you shave it off. No acid edge. You just flick it on on the teeth and you tell the patient, is this what you want to look like? Yes, that's on the first visit. You've had your consultation, you've done your exam, or the whole lot, and then for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you just bopped it. Because you know, you can whip it off if the patient didn't like it. And you ask the patient, and you tell, take, take it home and try it out. Take it home and try it out. And the patient takes it home and tries it out. And usually nobody ever notices. Because... People at home, which is their family, love the people who are in their family. They don't notice little things like this. Usually when I do a full mouth reconstruction and my practice was based on the foundation of full mouth reconstructions, I ask a patient after I've cemented it in provisionally, what did your family think? If a patient said they thought it was wonderful, I'll take it off and do it again. Because reconstructions, aesthetic dentistry should never be noticeable. If it is noticeable, there is something to be noticed. It is different. So patient goes back, nobody's noticed it. What happens? Within 24 hours, 48 hours, three days, it all starts falling off. Bits fracture off. That's when you make your sale. When bits fracture off, it looks so horrendous, the whole family realizes how terrible the teeth were. Yeah, when it falls out, that is when the difference is noticed. But what have you forgotten here? What has been forgotten here? I've done the anterior, I've got the aesthetics, I know what I'm going to do, but what have I forgotten? Yes, well, I take you to a litigation case. So I was expert witness on several cases. Uh, you know, I served on the General Dental Council, I served on disciplinary committees, all kinds of stuff. Yes, I worked for the Lord Chancellor, you know, for 18 odd years, uh, being one of the three, three wise men to help appoint judges and magistrates. Yes. So litigation and the law is part and parcel of what I know. And hence, that's what I will finish on at the end of this lecture as to what you need to watch out for. So this was a case, the patient was sent to me because the patient was unhappy with her teeth. When I asked her, what is it that makes, so the lawyer sent it. So I asked her, what is it that you're unhappy with the teeth? Is it the appearance? No, no, it's much better than my previous teeth. Is it the color? No, no, it's much, but there's something wrong. There's something wrong. I don't know what is wrong. 
And of course, if you've just heard my good friend and colleague, Professor Ziad's lecture, you realize what it was. The anterior guidance was changed on that patient. The patient's teeth are not just about occlusion, it's also about disclusion. The anterior guidance was missing. So this is my car. And in fact, it looking very pretty outside my house is, does not matter as much as how it functions. Looking pretty alone isn't enough because if it doesn't function well, you'll be having some people to tow your car away. Yeah? You need both estate and function. And in occlusion, it's function and dysfunction. It's occlusion and disclusion. Occlusion is the bringing of teeth together. That's done on verticillators. Disclusion is what's done on articulators. It is taking that, and you may not understand the significance of it, because a lot of occlusion is built on lies. We will explain to you and teach you why these things matter and whether there is any science behind it. I can tell you there isn't much science behind it, but practically speaking and legally speaking, it helps a huge amount. So it's a bit like this. You know, a mandible is like a three-legged stool. When you put an anterior deprogrammer, yes, it moves like a three-legged stool, and that's how you find centriculation. Centriculation is a bad position. It's an artificial position. You don't want it, but you want to relate to it. And then you close, it's like moving the three-legged stool back to its original position. So that's the concept that most people don't understand, including academics. And we will teach you to understand it because once you do that, you find life different. And once you understand where disclusion is, you want to capture it. The most important part of an articulator is its incisal guidance table. So here's one of my patients where the disclusion has been captured on a incisal guidance table with Duralay, as explained by Professor Ziad. Yeah, posterior stability and anterior guidance. That's the story of occlusion and disclusion. Mustn't forget it. It is so important. Manufacturers have pre-planned this as well as mechanical alterable tables. So this is KWOS. So I actually was with Walter Lang when he was, when he was inventing the Digma. And I'll and, and, and I, I contributed to some of the thinking behind it. It's a four-dimensional Facebook record. It's totally different from an arbitrary Facebook. We have one at the College of Medicine and Dentists, so Digma Two. Uh, I had the Digma One because, of course, I was part and parcel of the original, original bit of, uh, 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 let's say, understanding of it. So this, of course, is the traditional anterior guidance table, whereby you put in a bit of a click and then you move it around, capturing the anterior guidance. And then when you do your final work, you copy the anterior guidance back in reverse on the palatal surfaces of the anterior teeth. Because of course the patient wasn't susceptible when the patient came. The patient had no occlusal problems. The fact that you allowed the technician to build the disclusion with no prescription meant now the disclusion was an interference for the patient. And the patient was never happy. Now, cable, for example, this is a table, that's the incisal table on which you do this. See? And it's a reusable table because you can flick it out afterwards. After you've done it, as long as you vaseline it, you can flick it out. And then each time the patient comes back, you can slip it back on and reuse it. But there's a screw at the bottom. The screw base at the bottom actually has, at the base of it, an arbitrary anterior guidance table. And in fact, if you ask Cabo, they'll give it to you at different angles. They'll give you the screw at different angles so that if a patient didn't have anterior guidance, anterior disclusion, if you were going into the provisional phase, remember what Ziad said, Prof Ziad said, yes, it is not a temporary phase, provisional. Provisional means you're learning from it. We don't do temporary crowns here. We do provisional. We want to learn shape, color, aesthetics, function, dysfunction. So we place this. So to, if you had nothing to start from without having to find a kinematic face flow, like the digma, you can start with an arbitrary anterior guidance, yes, for that patient and build on it. And in fact, this is Cable's own, the Protar's own incisor guidance table where you can actually change the angles without needing this. So you can have it at any number of degrees. And this is Dina's, which I also have. 
Yes, I've had the Dina pentagraph, the pentronic, the SAM axiograph, the digma, the log. Yes, pair can change the anterior gyrates, and you can also create long centric. You can also create long centric on this. Yeah. So manufacturers know, dentists don't know. No point buying all this stuff if you don't know how to use it, because the condylar guidance is actually an interference. It's an interference. You need to know face bows are bad for smile line analysis. Face bows are contraindicated for aesthetic dentistry. You need to understand it. We will teach you those things. And in fact, here you are, I will show you. Now here you are, you've got anterior distortion, but look if a patient has reduced condylar guidance. Yes, when the patient has reduced condylar guidance, reduced anterior guidance, ends up with posterior interference. So you need to know what this is in relation to this before you can undertake the treatment on this patient. So I come to a different case, severe tooth surface loss, you know, a, a youth spent misuse with misused drugs and all kinds of things. And that's what she was in her teens. And very soon she went around like this. And we are of course going to reconstruct her somewhere along the line. And those are the teeth. And what I do when I have time at lunchtime is, you know, all these old composites that you have, you have which has expired. Everybody has expired composites, don't they? Yes. I mean, when manufacturers sell you a box of composites, you have you have shades that you will never use even on a monkey. And of course, they've all expired. What do you do with them? You can't send them to the third world. They have all expired. So what people like me tend to do, because I know composites are metameric, yes, have a chameleon effect, is that I use these and I do my own diagnostic backstop. So I sit there and usually it's my nurse who sits next to me and she's with the zap. She goes, two seconds zap, two seconds. And it's all done with the scalpel, just like in that other patient in the mouth. Yes. And then what you do is you make a quick pull down template. You don't even have to make plaster models. You do a quick pull down template. And when you show this to the patient, put your thumb over it. If you put your thumb over it, the shadow will make all these colors blend together. So remember this patient has tooth surface loss, which is very severe. I built it up with composites, just scalpel blade and old composite expired stock. Yes, because that's not going into the patient's mouth. Yeah. And then when I show it, I show my thumb over and the patient, oh, that looks all right. That looks all right. Looks like my picture. Hmm? And then I make a pull down template. Yes, a suck down template on that itself because I don't need to make a plaster cast. And then I fill it full of composite, stick it over the patient's teeth, no acid edge. Use a scalpel to just trim off the excess. Couldn't care less what the margins were like. Tell the patient to go home. Yes, take it home and try it out. It'll fall out. But when it falls out, the impact is so dramatic because they say, what's happened to your teeth? What's happened to your teeth? Yep, they'll want it fixed. I can tell you, they'll want it fixed. Of course, on that first day, I also made an arbitrary mock-up. And so when the patient comes back, I'm going to do it provisionally because I'm going to do fixed fixed work on, on the patient. Yes, I, I know my, well, my colleague who started off, Professor Meta, was extremely gentle, kind, and so on. Uh, but I'm on the last train home with the patients in their last stage of life. Can't faff around. They can't go into care homes and end up keep coming back to see me. So I'm cut and thrust. I'm cut and thrust but I go through the intermediary phase, the intermediary phase of plastic restorations from which I learn and then I replace it. Yes, so here you are. So this is my quick, quick fix. Doesn't take much time. I use a silicone index. And what do I do? What do I do? I build up the aesthetics. I build up the aesthetics. Lamella, lamella built up. Lamella, it takes no time at all. Five minutes a tooth, max. Then palatally, I don't use composite. Composite is a nasty material. It's lovely aesthetically on that day. It hydrolyzes, it, it breaks down. It's also a petrochemical product, which makes it a known carcinogen. That's why it kills pulps. Don't put it near pulps. But nevertheless, it's very pretty on the day you put it in. But it's also made of sandpaper. Composite is resin and filler. Filler is sandpaper. What's the sandpaper you use to sand your walls, to sand your car, to sand your shelves? Same stuff as composite, resin, filler, resin and sand, resin and sand. This is man-made sand and resin. So composites, so therefore in patients who are clenching parafunctionists, composites are bad material to even build up teeth because it beats the living daylights out of the opposing tooth. 
So you're putting composite, put it against composite. But most people parafunction, so it's not a problem. Parafunction is universal. Pullinger, Seligman and Pullinger produced that paper back in the 1990s, and Pullinger and I have lectured together across the world. And as he says, it's common. It's parafunction is natural. It's a good thing. It's a stress relief. Much rather parafunction than kill your partner. It's when you clench and parafunction, it becomes different. That's a different kind of occlusion, a different kind of reconstruction. And you need to come to us for us, teach you how to undertake clenching parafunctions. In the meantime, in ordinary parafunctions, because everybody parafunctions, you don't want to put composite on the palatal surfaces of discluding teeth. Because discluding teeth protect occlusion. Occlusion protects disclusion. Back protects the front. Front protects the back. Disclusion protects occlusion. Bang, bang. So if you're going to have disclusion, you don't want it to start wearing the opposing tooth. So we use something softer, a bisacral, which can bond to composite, or a compamer. So we place on compamers for the palatal, and then we let the patient go home and function on it. We just leave it to the patient. So now we wait and wait and wait. If it keeps falling off, we know we haven't got the occlusion right. We haven't got the disclusion right. So we go and make some adjustments. I'll show you lots of cases for white centric, long centric. Yes, the really complex ones. Yeah. So we allow the patient to work it out by themselves on their own time instead of our time. And once they have now created their disclusion, everything is good. We then take study casts of our temporary work and we construct the anterior guidance table. Now we can go back and copy the final crown and bridge work to this. So remember, don't forget disclusion when you do aesthetic dentistry. But that's not my lecture is still about. It is part, it's the middle way. So I'm telling you aesthetic dentistry, if you're going to go down that route and that is what you have marketed yourself as, don't forget function and dysfunction. Being pretty alone isn't enough. The patient must not come back and sue you for something nobody understands. And what else have you forgotten? My good friend and colleague, Professor Ziad, hadn't forgotten. It's frimitus. All teeth will have frimitus. Why do you have frimitus? Frimitus you have, you have frimitus. So that is when you put your finger on your tooth and you bite together. All of you, if you put your finger on your tooth and bite out to go, they go tap, 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 tap on your posterior teeth, you'll find your front teeth move. And the reason for that is because of not just differential mobility, but adaptive mobility of the teeth. Teeth can be intruded by almost 60 microns. So you have three, four, five, six shim stops worth of movement. You can have that much movement of the lower teeth hitting the upper teeth. And that's why for veneers, on patients who are parafunctionists, who have moving teeth and everybody's teeth move, they move between 20 to 60 to 80 microns in three dimensions. Imagine, just think about it. Veneers are stuck on the front of the teeth. Why do they fall off? They're not in occlusion. They're not in disclusion. The reason they fall out is because of the judder on them. The judder on them. The frimitus on them. When the frimitus hits, the veneers are stuck on with only micro-mechanical retention, tiny bits of retention on the reti pegs. And usually you're putting veneers on some other dentist, stupid veneers, where he's removed all the enamel. Only enamel has the reti pegs. Dentine does not have it. There is no dentine retention. When you come to adhesive dentistry, you realize dentine has no bonding. Dentine bonding is a fudge. And a lot of the many generations of bonding agents are there to reduce your time and effort. And it's very good for most patients because most patients are okay. It's like parafunctioning. Everybody parafunctions. It's like plaque. Gingivitis is common to everybody. It's not a big threat. Periodontitis is totally different disease to gingivitis. Totally different. It may not even be due to plaque. But that's a different lecture for another day. So like that, same again with frimitus. If you don't have enough enamel, you don't have micromechanical retention. Your veneers will keep popping off. So that's why you overlap it palatally. So you end up with macromechanical retention. To get micromechanical retention, the composite must shrink to lock against the reti base. That's the retention. 
the retention is mechanical. It shrinks and locks. It locks into the tiny enamel retipates. That's why you don't etch for more than 20, uh, 10 seconds, 15 seconds maximum. Because if you over itch, you've left too many dead spaces and then the bad color gets in from your coffee and tea and it looks terrible. So you etch sharp, etch flash, bond quick. But of course, if you don't have any enamel, you can't rely on dentin. Dentin is rubbish. It doesn't stick. The whole idea is to not allow it to push the composite out. That's why you have wet bonding. And because dentists don't know how much wet is wet, they incorporate the wetness into their hydrophilic monomers. Yeah? It's all very clever stuff. Yes, to try and make their product sell. That's why you wrap it over. Once you wrap it over, there's micromechanical retention of the enamel retipex locking, but there's macromechanical retention of the entire composite locking. The entire adhesive locks on itself. And that's the reason why you left all the incised leg. Huh? See, free, free lectures. Come and learn the real things. So, but really at the end of the day, go and find the best technician you can't afford. And you create a career with that person. I was very lucky. My technician came from the Lebanon, Nadim Kalban. He was Peter K. Thomas's own technician. And most of the work, if not all the work I show you, will be Nadim's. I just take the money. Hmm? So as a dentist with a team on song, you need the right information regarding the smile line, good study cards, gingival tissue control, sound tooth preparation. We'll teach you to cut like gods. That's if you come to the crown and bridge section. Of course, uh, Shamir will teach you the adhesive part of it, and that will be brilliant because he's brilliant. Yes, and 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 and, and, and Ziad, we all know he's already brilliant. Yes, and of course the functional pres uh, prescription of nathology with Ziad as well. Yes, diagnostic provisional, see, not temporaries. Chiasite characterizations, patient participation means we talk to the coconut of the patient. Correct selection of materials placed correctly, and we'll teach you about all the different materials. Why some are rubbish, some are not. But we have to use rubbish in some circumstances, whether we like it or not. It depends on who that patient is. You know what the problem is, it's who the patient is. The who the patient is far more important than what is the problem. And you need an excellent citation, but that's still not enough. That I'm afraid is still not enough. So what's missing? This is the paradigm shift. The world has changed, certainly in the West. It's a major change in how people think and get things, yes? We can't sell origami when patients expect a swan. Hmm? The game is changing. I should know. I was at the forefront of seeing all these changes happen, thinking, oh, by the grace of God go I. I could have been there. I could have been there. Aren't I lucky? Hmm? So really, silence does not equal consent. Consent in the Western world has to be informed and understood. But that's not all now. I mean, we know that, but it's more complex than that. Yes? You see, the legal framework has completely changed because there's new law coming in. It's all about previous case law. And the case law is changing rapidly all the time. And I'll bring you up to date with it. And this is Paul Tipton, a very fine dentist who said dentists are seen as easy pickings by the public and solicitors. And there's been a phenomenal rise of dental negligence cases. So much more litigation. A lot of the time you look at it and you think, gosh, it's not that bad. But yet, it's not very defensible. We've got to pay up. And once you start paying up, defense societies will charge you more for your indemnity insurance. And it's a mandatory requirement in the United Kingdom and many of the Western countries to have uh, indemnity insurance. And sometimes it can go into 30, 40,000 pounds a year for people who have not perhaps because they have intentionally made a mistake, but have made a mistake that they maybe shouldn't have. The old test, the Bolam test of 1957, that was due to a person who needed to have shock therapy because he was mentally unstable. And the doctor who gave the patient shock therapy did not tie the patient down on the, on the on, 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 on the chair before the shock therapy was given. So when the shock therapy was given, the patient flew off the chair, hit the floor, broke the hips, sued the doctor. 
case went to court, court said, ha, 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 doctors are always right. Just because some doctors might tie you in, it doesn't mean every doctor has to tie you in because some doctors don't tie their patients in. It's your fault for jumping off the chair and breaking your hip. I'm afraid that era is gone, finished over. We got a shock when the next era came, which was the Hux and Court in the Court of Appeal. And there it was said the courts must be vigilant to see whether the reasons given for putting a patient at risk are valid in the light of any well-known advance in medical knowledge or whether they stem from a residual adherence to out-of-date ideas. In other words, if you felt you didn't have to tie a patient in, when the knowledge said you did have to, then I'm afraid you're stuffed. But it took almost 10 years, more than 10 years, for that to come about. But that's not all. The Bolito case came. And the Bolito case came and said, excuse me, there may be a body of opinion which is saying this. There may be another body of opinion saying this. And both bodies of opinion, one from the Royal College of Surgeons of England, one from the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. Well, aren't they Royal Colleges of Surgeons? Aren't they from England and Edinburgh? I mean, I was a dean at the Royal College of Surgeons of England at one time. Yes. Who is right? Of course, I would say I'm right because I'm from England. Edinburgh would say they are right. And the judge said, no, the body of opinion must also be shown to be reasonable. And who decides that is the question. And the decision is made by the man on the Clapham omnibus. It's not made by the profession. We take professional views. I'm sitting from the Lord Chancellor's chair, the judge's chair. We take the views, but the decision is mine or it's the decision of my jury. They must think which opinion was better. Whoops. But it's moved on even further than that. Huh? This is James Garner and Doris Day. You won't even remember them. They're probably dead before you were born. Huh? These were in my time. Move on, darling, was a lovely movie. Hmm? The Montgomery in 2015. It was all about medical paternalism. In other words, it said doctors really cannot talk down to patients. Patients are autonomous. They have freedoms of independence, of choice. They should decide for themselves with all the information provided. So this was against the Lanarkshire Health Board. And what it actually said was, patients must make the decision. A reasonable person, a patient is considered a reasonable person. A reasonable person in the patient's position would be likely to attach a significance to the risk or the doctor is or should be reasonably aware that the patient would be likely to attach significance to it. So you need to tell them almost all the risks that a patient might consider significant. So now you can't turn around and say your tooth might die because I'm using a composite. Uh, you, 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 I mean, nowadays you can't turn around and not say your tooth might die because I'm using a composite. You will say that because composites are petrochemical products. They are known mutagens, they are known carcinogens. That's why more bacteria grow next to composites than they do against amalgam. Amalgam is micromercurial poisoning. Amalgam is not adhesive. There's always a gap between amalgam and the tooth. But amalgams leak a lot less than a composite. Why? Because no respecting bacteria is going to grow up their children under a micromercurial toxic time bomb. But they love composites because composites are petrochemical products and that's how evolution takes place. You have a mutagen, your children are going to have three heads and five hands. Isn't it wonderful? Far more attractive kids. So that's why most composites, once they start fracturing off the adhesion bit, are something where bacteria love to breed. Yeah? So you should be able to turn around and say, these are actually toxic to the pulp as well. And when you come, we'll teach you about the pulp, how the pulp defends itself despite you, despite you. And why it is you use an air rotor and not electric micromotor to cut teeth. Now that's interesting too. Why buy an air rotor when you can buy a cheaper micromotor going just as fast, but you don't cut teeth with that. Wow. Then the Muller case, the last I will show you. There are others in the pipeline. And this is against King's College Hospital NHS Foundation. But they turned around and said, you can't take an overview like that. You have to break it in two. 
you have to take it as a diagnostic question. First, you must find out whether it was wrong at the top. Then you have to decide whether it was wrong at the bottom. Double jeopardy. So the first type is when a patient's condition is unknown and the diagnosis is either right or wrong. If wrong, is it negligently so or not? And this was to do with, with, with some um, histological work that was done. The second type is a pure treatment where the nature of the patient's condition is known and the alleged negligence consists of a decision to treat or advise treatment of a condition in a particular manner. In other words, it's a two-step process now. So whether the medical practitioner acted in accordance with the practice accepted as proper and ordinary competent medical practitioner by a responsible body of medical opinion, which is decided by an individual who is not a medical person, and whether the practice survives bolitos, judicial scrutiny of being reasonable and responsible. Oh, that's a change in life, isn't it? So I'll show you a case. This is not mine. I picked it out of the internet and I show it to my students. And this patient came for aesthetic improvement, I believe. Yes. And I show the work that was done. And it really does look nice. I mean, you know, it's enviable. Yes. I mean, there's a bit of gingival inflammation. And one of the reasons you have gingival inflammation is if you're using adhesive dentistry, the adhesive leaches out from behind your veneer. That leaching out from behind your vinea hits the gingiva. Some patients' gingiva are more sensitive than other patients' gingiva. And that's why you have persistent inflammation after you've cemented adhesive dentistry. Adhesive dentistry, if you're going to cement anything with adhesive dentistry, make sure you put a barrier on the gingiva so that if it's a retraction cord, which is very lightly placed, that picks up all the adhesive and you whip it out. Make sure you polish the margins well from the adhesive. Because as long as the adhesive is there, you can't see the adhesive. It doesn't stick to the dentine. So because it is gingival and it is root surface and it is cementum, it can't bond to the cementum, but it overlays the cementum with small adhesive bits, a bit like, bit like, bit like Velcro. And inside these Velcro bits will be the bugs. They can grow there. And the Velcro itself is an inflammatory material. Composites are inflammatory. Yes? Next time you have a cut on your finger, put a bit of composite on it. Hurts like mad. Nasty product. Composites are high allergens. They go through gloves to produce the allergy. So you want to make sure that the gingiva is well protected whenever you use adhesive dentistry. Because if the material gets underneath there, it's a big problem. Because the gingiva can't heal very well. Hmm? Now, I showed it the before, I showed it the after, and I said they were lovely. My students all think they're lovely. Now let's show you the intermediate slide, the one in the middle. Now what do you think? Now, if you showed that to the patient or the patient's family, would they have approved of this? When really, your colleagues would have turned around and said, why don't you just add a bit of composite to it? Pop the inside little, and send them to Wyman Chan. Get Wyman to get the teeth white. Our Professor Chan is a miracle man. And you just had a bit of composite. Send it to Professor Shamir. Done. You don't even have to send him to Professor uh, uh, Ziad because, of course, you haven't changed the palatal uh, occlusion at all. Yeah? Now, what do you think? Now, this is a potentially serious litigation case. You can turn around and say, oh, I don't have this cast. I don't have You need to. Baseline records are compulsory, are mandatory. If you're going to treat a patient whom another person might think is harmful, you needed to have had the evidence to show that you had it. In the absence of it, well, whose word is going to be taken? Here is Martin Kelleher, an old adversary of mine just retired from King, one of the finest pairs of hands in dentistry, one of the most brilliant speakers. If ever he can, if you if he ever come across lecturing, uh, him lecturing, please go and listen to him. Outrageously funny, marvelously practical, and shows superb work. And he said, and this is in the journal published by the Royal College of Surgeons of England, which is very close to my heart. That's the Faculty of Dental uh, Surgery's journal. He said, the blatant destruction of teeth apparently are being undertaken to cure patients affected by porcelain deficiency disease. I mean, what a powerful statement. Why are you removing sound, good enamel, Raj, he said, 
Do your patients suffer from porcelain deficiency disease? Why do you want to replace good enamel with porcelain? Is that a disease? He went on to say this is a newish disease, identified by some dentists who also uh, seem to think that teeth suffer from hyperenamelosis, an excess of enamel. It's a new term coined by him, hyperenamelosis and porcelain deficiency disease. He wanted to say, it probably goes without saying that both of these conditions are imaginary, fictitious. Yet it appears to me at times that they are perceived to exist by some cosmetic dentist. Now he sits on the board of our largest uh, indemnity society, the Dental Protection Limited. Double mugging of these patients. These unfortunate patients are being robbed twice, first of their money and again of their enamel and dentine. So if you are coming to Britain to work, take heed of what I am saying. And we will teach you that. You may turn around and say, but the patient insisted. The patient wanted it. The patient swore they will not sue. He is a patient, he is a fictitious patient who came and said, my daughter is getting married to a prince in 10 days time. Can I have great teeth for the wedding, please? And you look inside the mouth and this is what you see. And you say, oh no. She says, no, no, I don't want dentures. It's 10 days, just put bridges in there. I know they will fail. I lose my teeth. I will sign any indemnity. And she signs, I know my teeth will fall out. I've insisted that you undertake the crown and bridge work. I am happy to pay for it. Here is the money up front. Please do the work. I will absolve you from any litigation. Witness, signed, sealed, handed over. Doesn't work. And doesn't work. Patients cannot write away their rights. It's a bit like buying something from John Lewis. It's one of the best department stores here. And they say, I'm afraid we can't give you a guarantee on this because it is something in the showroom. I'm afraid if it fails within one year, do you still have the guarantee? You cannot sign away the guarantee. If you're asked by a patient to undertake treatment that you believe is unnecessary, you must act in the patient because only the patient doesn't know, only you know, only you know. And the patient will come back and say, my bridges have fallen out, it's only lasted three weeks. But I said, I did tell you it won't last. Ha, 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 ha. What do you mean? Hmm? You signed an indemnity. That's not worth it because I didn't know all the uh, reasons. Yeah? Do not undertake treatment that will cause permanent damage to the denti, dentition or will be of no clinical or cosmetic benefit. This is after work from people like Professor Aubrey Shyam, uh, Professor Richard Elderton and all of the others. They turned around and said, people who didn't go to see a dentist regularly ended up with more teeth than people who went to see dentists regularly. We were the harmful people for patients. If the treatment fails, the patient may seek damages. And finally, a signed statement from the patient instructing you to carry out the treatment and absolving you from any of the state, stated adverse consequences may not provide a valid defense in the court or before the General Dental Council of the United Kingdom. So times have changed. You will need to practice defensive dentistry. And defensive dentistry is not a bad thing. It is not against the patient. It is to protect your reputation. And if you are a student of our College of Medicine Dentistry, our reputation, because our reputation will lie in your hands. And therefore we have an interest in protecting you and you must have an interest in protecting us. Hmm? The world, certainly in the West has changed. It has become far more litigious. And I would tell you without any hesitation that you will need to think when you put yourself out as a cosmetic dentist of all the consequences, not just aesthetics, not just function, but also how it will stand up to scrutiny. So therein lies not one paradigm shift, but several when it comes to the care of a fellow human being. I hope it's been food for thought. I'm allowed to be outrageous, but I'm not. It is what it is. Well, I hope I get to see some of you at least at the college at some point in time. And I hope you've had a very good conference. Thank you very much for having listened in. Thank you very much, Raj. That was as entertaining and enlightening as always. I always really enjoy hearing you speak, I have to say. Has anybody got any questions for Raj that they could put in the chat box?
Any questions? I can't find my chat box. You'll have to read it out to me. Uh, no worries. Hi. Nothing's nothing's come up yet. Somebody's thanking you for your great lecture. Thank you for your much uh, energetic presentation. I can tell you at my age, if it wasn't energetic, I'll probably be dead. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Raj, anybody, before we let him go? Well, all it leaves me to say is thank you all, guys. And I hope you have a wonderful, great, and superb career. Thank you very much, Raj. No doubt I'll see you soon. Cheers. So thank you everyone for today. I think it's been a really informative and excellent day. I've really enjoyed it myself personally. If you do want any more information, obviously you can contact the Knightsbridge Academy at info at kbac.uk. Um, for any information on the courses from the College of Medicine and Dentistry, it's a similar email address. So info at comd.org.uk. So if there's any, any questions or any further questions from that, just email either of the email addresses and we'll be able to assist you and get them answered for you. I think that's it from us. Um, is there anything that you want to say, Bulan, before we sign off? No, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for your effort, for your great um, introduction. Thank uh, you. See you next time. See you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for everyone. Thanks.